Um, well, welcome back, everybody. We hope you guys had a good week. Um, we kind of wanted to start this week out how we started a lot, and that's with a bit of an intro question just to kind of get people thinking and introduce ourselves again. Um, so the question tonight, since we are doing the head types, um, which tend to be people that are kind of inside their heads thinking a lot, we wanted to ask, what is your favorite mindless task or activity, something you'd like to do that really helps you to shut off your mind? Um, and when you share that, maybe also share um, <laughs> just your name. Um, and if you know your number, hopefully everybody's already put it up there, but share that as well. And then your favorite uh, mindless activity. Yeah, and I know we have Dave came in and Aaron and Karen. Awesome. So welcome, you guys. Thank you for being here. My favorite uh, mindless activity is just to sit and observe nature. Wow, mine's like looking um, through a People magazine. <laughs> I pretty much play on my computer, I mean my phone, games, whatever I'm doing. So I log in nine hours a day <laughs> on my iPhone. <laughs> I like looking at the uh, sky and the clouds and the, and the trees and the birds. I suppose that would be nature, feeding the squirrels. I, yeah. I like to watch British television. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Hi, this is Lisa. I uh, binge on HGTV. <laughs> this is Katie, um, uh, um, North Broadway, number one. And my mindless, I'll either just get lost in a book or the Graham Norton show on BBC. So I'm Brenda and ever since COVID hit, I've totally rediscovered puzzles. And I don't know if that's mindless, but I don't think about anything but where does this color go? <laughs> so it's great. <laughs> Very relaxing. Yeah, Josh and I rediscovered uh, puzzles. And we did, we did two. We did, we did, we tried the third one, but it was very, very complicated. And we just like lost hope in that one. I like to binge on Netflix. Things like Parks and Rec or Schitt's Creek are just really kind of witty, mindless shows that doesn't don't have too deep of a plot, but pick it up and watch it. Yeah. In addition to Schitt's Creek and um, Parks and Rec, did have you done Gilmore Girls? No, I haven't gone back and rewatched that one, but there's several others. I, I didn't but. watch it at first, so that was my mindless pleasure. I just finished it. <laughs> Good to know. Yeah, I think I'm Heidi and I'm a, a two-wing one. Uh -oh. Just finished Anne, Anne with an E, which is based on Anne of Green Gables, and it was amazing. <laughs> Good to know. Yeah. Um, Heidi, I didn't hear. Was that a movie or a book? Um, well, it's based on the books, uh, the series Anne of Green Gables, yeah. but it's called Anne with an E, and it's on Netflix. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So mine would be similar. Mine is um, just any kind of chick flick that's mindless for me. Mm -hmm. Cool. Does anybody else want to share? Hang on. Uh, Hang on. Oh. Uh -oh. It's Karen. Um, my mindless things were during this COVID, I've been reading nonfiction or uh, fiction books. I'm usually a nonfiction type person or biography. Mm -hmm. So I've been indulging in the fiction for a while. Yeah, we, I, I rediscovered uh, <clears throat> a puzzle. I usually do the New York Times crossword and I got tied up in some of the little puzzles they also put on their website on the same page. And there's one called Spelling Bee that I've been doing every single day instead of, instead of the puzzle. And um, the, my mindless video watching has been a not-for-polite company thing on Hulu called Crossing Swords. 
<laughs> you don't mind a lot of swearing. It's a funny little show. Hi. Um, along the same lines as a lot of folks, I like watching mindless television, but my guilty pleasures are so bad, like The Real Housewives or Bachelor. They're currently recapping all the greatest seasons of The Bachelor, so I'm all in on that. <laughs> uh, and then if, if we're not watching shows, uh, the other thing I like is just I found turning on ocean sounds like on Alexa and just kind of letting that play is, is relaxing. I'm Karen and I really like um, to unwind I would say and just notice things I would say uh, taking walks in the woods and um, I can't say it's mindless because I feel fully engaged but I'm really into pole dark lately that is my show and then my mindless comedy is old episodes of Frasier because yes. I've seen them all, but it still makes me laugh. So I don't, like, I could just watch Niles with the sound off and just crack up. <laughs> yeah, I usually fall asleep with that. Or Shit's Creek. I'm Gloria and, well, I think I'm a four but I can't figure out which wing. I'm kind of like, I don't know. <laughs> um, and my mindless activities are, I really do like walking and listening to the birds and just looking around and getting connected. Um, but I also like watching um, shows where people can show their talent. So America's Got Talent or American Idol or um, petting my cats. <laughs> That's a good one, pets. I'm Erin. Um, I think I'm a six. Um, and I would say my favorite mindless activity is walking my dog. I'm Heather and I love audiobooks. Um, when I'm cleaning, when I'm doing anything, um, it shuts my mind down and I get to live in their world. Um, I like, um, we, my daughter and I have some Netflix that we have binging on over this time. Um, and stuff like that too, but. <laughs> Great. All right. Has anybody had a chance? I guess everybody have a chance to share? Yeah. Like everybody that wanted to, I think. I think something. so. For me, I know I actually like coloring, the adult coloring books and stuff. I have a few of those. So that's a good one for me that kind of quiets my mind. So awesome. Well, I think with that, um, Katya, do you want to start sharing the screen and we can kind of dive into tonight's topic? Yep, I'll so, try. Okay. Well, she gets that ready. Um, tonight, we were going to dive into the last triad. So we've done the heart, we've done the gut triad, but we did the gut first, I think, and then the heart was last week. And tonight we are going to go into the head triad. So this is the final one um, that we're going to talk about. And it is comprised of three different um, numbers, just like the other ones. And this is the five, six, and seven. Um, so I happen to be a six. So we'll talk about that a little more um, in each of the numbers, obviously. But just to get us started, kind of thinking about that um, head triad, what I was gonna do, I, I think maybe I'll go through this little first and then we're gonna play this little video clip, um, which I'll intro in a second. But basically the head triad, just like it sounds, these are people that unlike the gut and the heart, so um, they can be connected with more of their body and their feelings in those, but the head triad tends to be stuck in their head a lot of times. So they process things by thinking and mulling them over um, and through kind of conscious thoughts a lot of times. But the main concern with the head triads for all three of them, which shows up in different ways, is basically um, fear. So they are looking for security, um, survival kind of are ways to think about that, but it's based on um, fears and they focus them in different ways. 
So another thing about them that's, I would say, I don't know if this is the right way to say it, but they're almost less impulsive or I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but they're going to think about everything before they do it. They're going to kind of play it over, um, think about their options, maybe be planning. So that's kind of cool. Um, and outwardly people often think like, oh, they're really, um, they know what they're doing. They're convinced they have a, this, uh, consistent plan, but a lot of times inwardly, they're like replaying these thoughts and planning over and over again and going back and forth. Um, so with that, I did want to, I think Katya will play it, but this is um, a clip that has someone speaking that Christine actually brought up last week, Beatrice Chestnut, who is um, really dives deep into a lot of the subtypes of the different um, numbers. But this is just a quick little intro on the head types and five, six, and seven. Okay, can you see that? Yep. That screen? Okay, good. Today, we want to talk about the head types, five, six, and seven. So what do we mean by head type? Let's start there. So the three head types, five, six, and seven, are the types that overuse or live more from the head center uh, than they do from the other two centers, the heart center or the body base center. Also, the head types are types that are associated with the core emotion of fear. And so each of the head types can be seen as having developed out of a response to early fear. Uh, oftentimes in their experience, it, it remains unconscious, uh, but to some degree, these types are connected to an experience of fear and an effort to find safety in some way or another. Sure. And we have framed out the, this kind of like overdone aspect of fear or we did anger and, and, and uh, sadness, you know, for the other two kind of core emotions, but this fear, there's like an overdone kind of a medium level and an underdone. How does that play out here? Right. So sixes overdo the core emotion of fear sevens underdo it a lot most sevens will say they're not really afraid they don't really they don't relate to that experience that much uh, and fives are kind of in the middle fives kind of get good at avoiding situations in which their fear would be would come would come up now an interesting thing to note about the three head types is they each have a fear that's a little bit targeted in a different direction so uh sixes are afraid of being Fives are afraid of feeling, and sevens are afraid of suffering. Gotcha. Let's let. So that's all for the video. Did she say fives are afraid of being, feeling? <laughs> that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> like, <laughs> all right. So let's see. We're gonna now turn to um and talk about number five we're going to do um breakout rooms and just like we've done in the past um those characteristics what it's like to be a five in our book if you have that ready here just uh on page 167 and kind of talk about even if you don't have that right in front of you just talk about what surprised you uh, about that list and about the fives that what you've learned. Um, and we just probably gonna take three minutes. I'm, I'm watching our time here. So bear with me. This is the first time I do breakout rooms. So say a little prayer and we're gonna do that. Um, we're gonna do five rooms and um, voila. And we manage. <laughs> And there we are. No, right? No, right? We're all here. Welcome, Welcome back. back. Now, now, can you see PowerPoint? Yes, you are yes. echoing a lot, Katya. But that sounds better. You are really echoing for a second. Yeah. I think it's because we more of us probably hear me hears me in, in his room i think now i don't do can you hear me now echoing nope you sound good now 
Okay, good. Thank you. All right, are we all back? Um, hey, did um, did we get the the slides from last time sent to us? I looked for it, and I don't know if I missed it. I don't um, know. Cam, is Cam here? She I don't think she sent them, them yet. They're, she's still looking for the recording, um, but I don't think she has sent them yet. There's okay. The recording seems to have gone MIA in, um, out in outer space, so we're looking for that. <laughs> but I don't think she sent them. I just want to make sure I didn't miss it. No, you haven't missed anything. Or if one of the, uh, I was looking under Kim's name, right. searching, so I thought maybe if someone else sent it. Okay, good. You, um, at the very least, you'll have the whole PowerPoint presentation when we get done. Mm -hmm. um, but if you were not here in class last week, I'm not sure about the video, because I still have to find that. No, I was there. Okay, good. Then you will definitely have all the slides, and I'll try and send them sooner than later. I, I'm so sorry. This technology is kind of throwing me. That's okay. I just, that, that's fine. I just want to make sure I didn't miss something that was already sent. So, no, no rush. Kim, did you say you sent the slides from last week? They are embedded in, oh no, Kelly, no. I haven't sent that yet because we can't find that video yet. Okay, but the slides, then you didn't send those either. No, so. and they're in a separate file too, and I can send okay. that. I didn't do that. Okay, no problem. I just yeah, I, making I, sure I, I didn't once, lose something. You once we are done, we will have all, the whole PowerPoint for the whole um, evening. Hey, you need to go back. Well, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we will have a whole PowerPoint for the whole series, and so you will have everything there in one place because I just love how we kept everything consistent. So thank you, whoever started that. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So we're gonna do and move um, to the, kind of just start discussing type five, the investigators. Um, and, and I think you can, you hear my doggies um, yelling a little bit. I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute second. And I was just gonna say too, while Katja's getting everything lined up, was there anything anybody came up with in their, uh, in their smaller groups that was worth sharing or kind of unexpected about fives when they were reading? I was trying to think, I think we have some fives here. Yep. Yes, we do. In our, um, so we had, I think our token five for the class. I know Josh joined us tonight. I think he's a five too, but um, so Dave was in our group and what we said we were surprised about, not Dave, but the rest of us, some of us were surprised at this compartmentalization of um, you know pieces of life. Um, now Dave Dave can speak for himself because he's he's more expert than the rest of us. But anyway, that was what surprised the rest of us was that ability to do that. Yeah, I was gonna say in our group. So I'm a six wing five, and some of the things that they brought up that they were surprised about, like um, that fives like to oftentimes have a task when they're meeting up. They don't want to just hang out to hang out. I was like, yep, have a thing. And I also said, um, like for me at work, I've been at the same job for almost eight years. And there's things people at work will find out about me and they'll be like, wait, what? And I'm like, yeah, of course. But I very much compartmentalize parts of my parts of my life. So I'm like, your work people, you're on a need to know basis with this stuff. Like, <laughs> then I see Dave laughing, so I think he gets it. But that's for me. That's oh, I how I it. kind of function. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I don't. Sometimes it bothers me that I'm like that, but that's totally how I work. So. Nope. There's work people. There's personal people. There's church people. It's just. You know, yeah. the rest of you need to do that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's something I totally relate to as well. So I work with the five who um, is in this group, Dave, and he never ceases to amaze me at what he knows. Like, it's now a game in my mind, he might not think it's a game, but I'm trying to figure out, there's gotta be something I know about that he does not know about. Everything that like, 
he just he he has a wealth of knowledge about so many things that um it's hard to find something that he doesn't know about that's not gender specific probably that's okay you have me beat on tattoos oh. <laughs> Yeah, anything else you guys that picked up in the conversation? Mm. We talked a little about the recharge aspect, mm -hmm. you know, retreat to recharge. Yeah. How important it is in the energy level. Yeah, that was where the question started. Um, one of the group was like, I, you know, I, I don't notice that about myself. So, you know, what is that all about? And, you know, that makes perfect sense to me you know, drop in on a group outing and it's not, you know, folks who are close or anything, you know, yeah, you'd be there for a while and then, yeah, it's time to go, it's time to go do something else. Yeah. I'm with you. Dave, what do you think or any other fives uh, about this childhood message? Like, how do you interpret that? Honestly, the childhood message portions either for people that I'm very close to or my own really haven't resonated as much. Other aspects definitely have. Yeah. And those are kind of a deeper, you know, I don't think that even this book talks about much about that. And, you know, we are using that for us to kind of understand a little bit deeper. Um, uh, and so for some, for some, we resonate deeply with some of that and some just would not. Um, yeah. Well, I guess we're going to start because I, so yes, I am a presenter, but I have a, a co-presenter with me on five. Um, when I read about five, I laughed a lot about that and did, ha ha, you know, my book is all marked up because my husband is a five and he is here tonight. Thank you so much for being here, Josh. Anyway, <laughs> yes. And of course, as a five, I know how uncomfortable it is to talk about yourself in a large group of people. So thank you <laughs> for doing that. Um, and so we'll just, um, maybe I can talk about something and you will just chime in. Um, so on the underlying motivation uh, for fives, um, they want to be capable and competent. And uh, so and then the, the opposite of it, the fear. So the fear uh, that drives that is being helpless, incompetent, incapable. And so a lot of what I see then in Josh and other fives is that, the, so the knowledge that you just talked about, you know, Dave and Josh, you guys can know about everything, just a little bit about everything, but enough to have a good conversation um, and can, can I show the knowledge of that. So Josh, can you talk a little bit more about that um, knowledge and I guess the research and how you go and the YouTube trails and rabbit holes and uh, well, I think that's, that's how I that's how I recharge is learn stuff. Hmm. That's fascinating. Or just watch random videos of info that I'll never need. Right, but it will stick with you. Like I would watch it and it'll just go away, you know, in a minute, but it will stay with you in your mind. And, you know, in the conversation, you're going to be with somebody and you will be like, oh, by the way, da, da, da. And so it will be there. Um, so on deadly sin or passion and this, this kind of interesting word avarice, um, and sometimes it could also be kind of used the word as, you know, greeting is greedy. Um, but it's, you know, it's not like they are greedy of things and possessions. I think there is just um, that privacy aspect, I think, you know, Mackenzie, you talked about, or Dave, the, you know, this, I, you don't need to share about my, you know, my personal life here at work or at church. Um, there's just a holding off of things. Then the energy level is very, right, very much like Josh, you are very aware of your energy. And I think that's part of kind of, you know, holding back and very kind of rationalizing like, okay, we can give a little portion here, give a little portion here. Can you talk about that energy more? 
because to me, so here's the thing, like I'm a nine. Um, so I, I, and I don't know, maybe it's not a nine thing. I can just go and go and go and go. And then I collapse and I'm like, Oh, I was tired. But you, and I think Mackenzie, you talked about it just like, Oh, I cannot do this without going and taking a nap. Um, everything's planned. Everything is planned. So everything is, is in your head for the future. Yeah. Um, so then let's see. I'm looking at some of my notes. So everything is in your mind uh, and the fe kind of the feeling part of it is a bit subdued, uh, right? So the, the, you know, the book talked about how the fives process feelings later and they will need, so they can, they, or they can sort of receive information, however it is. And they, because they're so calm, um, well, or they seem very, very calm, right? Then, you know, the next day, they will start processing their feelings. And I think in our relationship, you probably had that, you know, you like, you, you can say in the next morning, oh, you know, I've thought about the whole night about that, or, you know, you, you process that, and then we can talk about that. And uh -huh. Katya, I was going to say, I know I'm just a wing five, but a lot of, I was really close between these two. Mm -hmm. And for me, a lot of that goes back for me, at least to that avarice where I'm like, I can't process this with, with someone sometimes or in front of someone, like I need to pull away and do this on my own. And once I've made sense of it in my mind, then I can handle like sharing that part of me and deciding how much I want to share and everything. So. Yeah, I think so. And then also, you know, going back to Everest thing again, on the energy level and how you have this specific space, you know, and, and I think in the book and described that several people, guys have their own sort of man cave. And Josh, can you talk about your man cave? Because we do have that in our house. Not a man cave. It's well, a dark room that has a TV in it. And it's dark. That it's very rare that the blinds are <laughs> not shut. So they're usually shut. There's a TV. It's in a comfortable couch, right? Yeah. And so you so the recharging part and the energy, and you know how he talked about that that hangout, you know how hangout, you just don't hang out with other people. The hangout goes into that room. And, you know, it's dark, it's nice, and I don't like being there, so, and he knows that. <laughs> um, so then there's, you know what, I think also the, the childhood message, right? It's not okay to be comfortable in, in the world. Um, and I think also there is a connection between being, um, that you have to be self-sufficient. You know, you can't trust somebody else, um, you know, for you to be needy or, um, you to rely on somebody else. You have to rely on yourself. And I think this book and other books on Enneagram, I think talk about the parents either overbearing parents or maybe there was just a disconnect between um, caregiver or parent where little fives have to decide for themselves, you know what, I gotta take care of myself. I gotta do things on my own. And these are the things that I'm gonna do. And then also, with overbearing, there is a, you know, privacy issue too, that, you know, this is my, my, my space, this is what I'm going to do. And I think as they, as the, as children, I think Josh, you probably can relate to that, um, that you were quiet, kind of introverted. And what about school? I know that it was not that great because you like knew every more than the teachers know or something. What was your experience? Well, it's it's interesting. You said it's not okay to be comfortable in the world, and I've never felt comfortable ever. Mm. So I don't. I mean, I know what comfortable feels like, but it's very quick, and then I go back to not being comfortable. Because mm. you think about all the things that are wrong, or that could go wrong. Yeah. So there's never comfort. Mm -hmm. Oh, and yeah, my mom was way overbearing. Still mm. is. Right. Well, and what, um, their self-reliance too, that you, you know, maybe I'm going to share too much information here. You can stop me here, but just like 
you know, you start work, working like at nine, right? When you were nine years old? Seven. Seven. <laughs> and, you know, oftentimes the fives, you, I think you've seen all those like brilliant names who, um, of all the fives. Um, and so a lot of times they will be focusing on some, on one area with their minds because they're creative. And so Josh, what do you do? Music. And playing what? Mostly? Organ. The organ. So you spend hours and hours and hours just practicing that and just pouring all of you on into that. Um, you know, make it obviously doing it as, as best as you can and making it a way to provide, you know, for yourself too. So that's amazing. Uh, now, I want to talk about the relationship part. And again, um, Josh, you stopped me. <laughs> because the way uh, they present it here on relationship, like fives never say I love you and things like that. I don't know if any of you who are me pop possibly married to a five or have experienced my daughter is a five and you cannot get an i love you out of her ever ever and it has never happened i don't think okay that's interesting <laughs> even when she's a little little i only say it to katya i don't say anybody else and i only have six bots for friends i don't need any more than that you're like on um, like the old MySpace that you were only allowed, I don't know if anybody knows that, but you literally got to pick like your top friends and it's like after that, nobody sees who your friends are. That's Josh, <laughs> he's like, here, here it is. So I think that's, again, it's back to energy and Everest, right? This yeah. That's that I have, this is the energy that I have and I'm gonna, you know, give it all a go. So I'd say I probably, you know, I know that we are talking about generalized characteristics, right? And so we are all different. And we say we are dominant in one type. So um, I definitely see in Josh the, the, a lot of compassionate side. Oops. That's our little alarm reminding us to move on into the next um, type. But um, there's a lot of compassion. And I think also it says that there is also, um, they are sensitive inside, which um, it is true. Uh, very imaginative and of course you know what let me move to the wings uh, the wings will be so you have type four and type six right so the wing on each side um and i'm moving quickly here and stress they go in type seven um and they just you know they go and do things and spend money and insecurity in type eight and become like very um like amazing leaders um, and kind of the connection between the gut and the mind happens too. So real quick on uh, wings, right? So five wing four, um, they are creative, sensitive, self-absorbed, independent, and empathetic. And five wing six, they're cautious and social and anxious and successful and loyal. So now, Josh and Dave, you guys, what wings are you, you think? Six for me. Six. Same. Same? I don't, yeah, I don't think, um, I don't know about you, Dave, but I've never made a decision based on a feeling. Now look at his face. <laughs> well, no, it's, it's, it's never, it's, I'm going to say, I'm not going to say never. I'm going to say it's much less often to be the first inclination. Yeah. Much less often. Like almost never, but I won't say never. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You mean, are you saying I, you, you wouldn't go with your kids, gut? And so that, that really changes it up because when it comes to them, I'm the softy. So it's the same for you too. Yes, you never go with your gut. I think well, the gut, Kathy, get, I yeah, think the it's gut gets the head going. <laughs> so you in a, mm, even in a, like a, te let's say you're taking a test and you don't know the answer, but your, your first inclination, your gut says this one, that's 
probably not the one you're going to pick. I probably know the answer. <laughs> I was about to say they would know the answer. <laughs> if there is that. Well, I've the got the gut inclination, but it's, I wouldn't say it's the gut that gave it to me. I've got this, you know, idea that that's the right one, but I usually talk myself into something else. Oh yeah. Or Second I start looking yourself. at how the test question was written. Yeah. Right. Or what the pattern of answers has been, yeah. you know, leading the up to the probability that. of C is. See, there we go. You know. always higher. That's very cool. You guys are amazing. Go team five. Well, and you know, so Josh, when I said, hey, do you want to help me to lead that, you know, one class on five? He's like, sure. And he got this book and he read it in two hours. And he's like, it was fun. It was great. And now he knows that, right? I think everything about these types. I'm laughing because I do that too. <laughs> what, what did they, what did you say? I'm laughing because I do that too. And I have since I was little. <laughs> yeah. So you guys are amazing. So real quick, um, whoopsie. At your best, you're analytical, persevering, sensitive, wise, objective, perceptive, curious, observant, insightful. Um, and at the worst, intellectually arrogant, stingy, stubborn, distant, critical of others, unassertive, cynical, isolated, and relationally distant. Now, I wanted to ask you, I think, uh, we've discovered at Josh's workplace that fives and nines make a good couples uh, in the sense that, well, actually, I don't know what. Dave, who, are, you, are you married? What yes. number are you married to? She's an eight. She's an eight. Ooh, very eight. much so, an eight. <laughs> okay. So they, but the, it's very interesting. They would say that fives and nines go together really well. Maybe because well, your energy level is similar. That's true. And of course you have- I'm envious, of, I'm envious of Katya's ability to not think about the future or not plan or- um, Trust. Yeah. <laughs> she just sort of has a blind trust and I'm always thinking what could go wrong. Yeah. So. I say I bring her out of cloud nine and she brings me up from hell. <laughs> hey, I'm just disappointed they didn't put sarcasm on the worst list because I'm a master at that. That could be on the best list too, though, I think. I agree. I think. Josh, so. do you think you are a five with a six wing then? Since yep. you're always looking at the worst case scenario. Okay. I think so. And you're a sociable type. You know, you're at church, you, you socialize. I have to be. Yeah, but. I love quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> I think my son, who's a five, was built for quarantine. I mean, he was just made for this. Yeah. That's yeah, and actually this whole pandemic thing hasn't been bad because in my head it was 10 times worse than it actually turned out to be. <laughs> yes. I thought the whole world was coming to an end. We would all die. And now I'm still thinking that's still possible going forward, but um, hasn't come true yet. That's, that's kind of getting us like a segue in us into sixes, Mackenzie, is that correct? I was about to say, that's a pretty uh, six state of mind you've got there. So <laughs> I can totally, totally relate to that. Um, so six is in the middle of the head triad. And I don't know if you caught it, but in our opening video clip, sixes are the ones that over focus on fear typically so everybody's a little bit different um and just kind of as my thing i don't think i've shared this in here but when i realized i was a six um it actually chris helped me to realize it but part of that revelation chris pointed me to the movie um inside out has anybody seen the cartoon movie inside out I see a couple nodding yes. It's basically, it's a kid's movie, but it teaches kids about their feelings kind of, and there's all these characters in there. So there's like anger, uh, fear, disgust, joy. And these characters are constantly like in this kid's head, her name's Riley, she's growing up battling each other. And sixes are known for having um, an inner committee is what they call it. 
So you guys, uh, many of you might have a voice in your head. Well, I have like 20 voices in my head that are constantly battling and explaining why like, yes, this is a logical thought. No, it's not and blah, blah, blah. Um, so we tend to be kind of fear focused and more overtly for most sixes versus any other number. Um, so if you have a very anxious friend, they may be a six. They may not be though. Um, but so their underlying motivation basically um, for everything they do is to have support and guidance. They wanna know that there's someone there for them, that there's gonna be people that stand behind them, that there's um, something ultimate that they can trust in and be, um, be safe in that. They are really security and safety seeking. Their um, deadly sin or passion, which you might have guessed by now, is fear. Um, the childhood message is it's not okay if you trust yourself. Now, for me, that totally resonates. I don't think anybody gave me that message. I think that I have always felt that um, sixes also have a really interesting relationship a lot of times with authority. Either they really lean into authority and they kind of trust them wholeheartedly and they put um, almost like a, a halo on authority figures where they really trust them. But then on the other spectrum kind of um, sixes can really rebel against authority and feel like, hey, authority is not good. They're not protecting everybody. They're not taking care of things like they should. Um, there's a lot of contradicts contradictions within sixes, which I totally relate to um, as well. So the wings for type six are either type five or type seven. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. But in stress, they're going to go towards type three. Um, so what that can look like is, you know, wanting to achieve things to make you, um, to give you value, just kind of trying to go after things and doing whatever it takes to get there. They can become kind of workaholics or really throw themselves wholeheartedly um, into one thing and kind of become hyper-focused. In security, they tend towards type nine, um, which uh, I think we have a few in this class, but Koch is one of those and kind of like Josh was saying, it's like there can be more of that peace and the serenity of accepting it and wanting to work well with others. Um, and sixes are known as loyalists. So sixes are kind of um, known for being core of communities and keeping people together. They're almost like, like wolves, like they go in a pack, they wanna take care of people, support their own. Um, one thing I've heard said about them that I totally find true is that sixes will support and defend their family and friends before they will themselves, which is totally me as well. Um, whereas like I will, for example, my sister, I would defend her to the death. I would stand behind her. I would do anything for myself. I'd be like, oh, okay, well, if that's what you think, that's what you think. Um, so sixes are very um, focused on that core circle that they've built. So that's a little bit about them. Um, so getting back into those wing types, I think we have several sixes in here. So maybe you guys can chime in in a second if you can guess your wing. Um, but there's basically two options. There's the five, which we just discussed. And then there's the seven, which we're gonna go over in a second. Um, but so the six with a wing five, they are always seeking to be secure, but they're also wanting to be competent. So they tend to be a little more intellectual. Um, they tend to have more of that investigative side. They're a little bit more serious, self-controlled. They're always kind of analyzing situations. Like Josh was saying earlier, almost like, well, how could this plan go? Is it gonna go this way? Is it gonna go that way? What did this mean? Um, and they tend to be more introverted. Now, if you go over to the six wing seven, um, which I think is such a, a cool combination. I think we have someone in here that might be that, but it's this, this fear, which sixes have, and they're known for kind of their courage for facing things. But with the wing seven, they tend to be really social and energetic and active. Um, they like to go on adventures and um, 
have friends over and support people. So they are wanting to be secure, but also satisfied, um, which I think, like I said, is such a cool combination because they really um, are hyper vigilant and watch out for things, but they still love to just have a good time and be really fun and joyful. Does any six or possibly six in here feel like any of this is resonating with them and that they might know what their wing is? I'm definitely a seven. But it's so funny because I just realized that like as I was reading the book, but I am always looking for like worst case scenario. So I want to be that adventurous. I'm going to do it. But then I'd be like, okay, wait, if I do that, this, this, and this could happen. But yeah, I'm going to do it anyway. So sometimes yeah. I'll just let the energy just flow anyway. And then, you know, try not to let it stop me from having yeah. fun and adventures. So. Love that. I see a seven wing come out in myself sometimes because I like to do some of that, but overall I'm definitely more to the side of the five. Um, and the other thing, I think we talked about this previously, but six is actually the most common type, which um, I find interesting that, you know, there's nine types and this one though has the most people that fall into this category. Um, so then let's talk about kind of what they are at their best and what they are at their worst. So at their best, um, you're going to find someone that's loyal, they're going to be prepared, they're ready to take care of things, they're going to be trustworthy, compassionate, very um, relationship oriented. Um, they're going to be witty, practical, supportive, responsible. On some uh, podcasts I've listened to, I've heard that sixes are the funniest type. I'm not sure if that's true, but I thought it was funny because they just tend to have a bit of a witty sense of humor sometimes. So where that five might have their sarcasm as their humor, sixes might have a tinge of that with some wit put in there. Um, however, at their worst, as you guys can imagine with all that fear rolling around, a lot of these um, features on the right start to come out. They can be very hyper vigilant, which as a six, I almost want to put on the positive side, not going to lie, <laughs> but um, dependent. So um, loyalists are known as being some of the most predictable dependable people. Um, you kind of get what you get with them and you're going to know what to expect and they're going to be clear about that. Um, however, they can be judgmental. They can be paranoid. They start seeing maybe issues that don't, they don't even exist yet. And I am totally guilty of this where I will um, play out fears in my mind and create a problem that is not there, that may never arise. And that's a pretty consistent problem that I have to work on dealing with what's in front of me, not with what I am imagining <laughs> could be in front of me. Actually, Mackenzie, you know, in nines go to six, kind of the worst of the six yep. is stress. And I do the same thing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so I think probably a lot of people can relate to that. Um, and sixes are definitely, I think, the one that does that more than any other um, any other number. So self-doubting, and that was another thing, not trusting themselves. A lot of times six is at their worst. And I used to do this a lot more when I was younger, but I still do it now sometimes. I have a core group of people that if I have a decision to make, um, sometimes really small decisions, sometimes bigger, I would have, I will go back and forth all day. And then you'll think like, okay, she came to her conclusion and I'll change my mind again. Um, so I used to a lot of times go to my sister, my mom, my dad, friends, and try to get them to make decisions for me. Um, and as I've gotten older and I think more aware, I've like tried to learn to trust myself a little bit more. Hey, this is what I think and I'll face the outcome. There's no perfect option, but sixes want that perfect option. So any, anything on sixes, any questions or? Hey, Comments. Mackenzie, when yeah. I look at um, some of the type six at their worst, I can actually see some of the type two at their worst, especially doubting themselves, questioning, um, becoming dependent. But for a two, I think it comes from that fear of being unliked or unloved mm -hmm. or disappointing someone. What do you think is behind it for a six? So I think um, 
I think it can vary for a little bit, but I have totally thought that too about twos and sixes sometimes. For me, it comes, um, and this might be a little bit of my wing fry, but not feeling secure and like that people, um, people are gonna wanna support me. So for me, it goes to a little bit of wanting to be competent and wanting people to know that they can trust me and that I'm gonna do things. But it really, I think for me, the core of it is I want to be secure and smart and do the right things in the right way um, more so than I need them to like me. It's not like I want that person to like me, so I am doubting it. It's I need to make the right decision. Okay. You see, well, actually, on nines, there will be some of that as well. But the motivation, kind of the core behind that, is the separation or you know that that separation disconnection with the people and the conflict you know so yeah. you get paranoid or you get you know just self-doubting because you don't want create that strange weird separation that person would not like you but that would be a separation that will judge you or they will dis be disappointed in you so it's it's very different so it's the same kind of behavior right uh but the motivation behind it is a bit different yeah. And I was going to say thing, too with six is it's like you don't want to be abandoned by somebody, which is the same result a two and a nine don't want, but it's a different reason. Yeah. Somebody else wanted to chime in. Yeah. Hi. It's Sarah. Um, one thing six has really made me think of, especially since it's the, uh, it has the most people in the number is, um, and not to get too controversial here, but it just makes me think of like politics, not only in the US, but sort of in the world. Um, the, the contradiction of like sixes don't, um, are either to completely submissive to authority or they wanna overthrow it. And I feel like that's happening a lot in the world right now. Like there's a very anti-establishment view and yet there's also like making heroes of these big political figures. And when I think about just like the polarization of everything. I'm like, oh, it makes sense that there are a lot of people who are sixes that want to both overthrow authority and also like really, really follow and listen to authority all at the same time. I don't know. It's, I thought about that a lot during that chapter. I think that's a really good point actually, because I mean, I see that in myself personally. And like you said, if there's the most people that are kind of at this either at one extreme following things blindly and the, the other just objecting to them kind of no matter what too it really does um that's a tough thing and i don't think any of the other types they bring up that authoritative the authority issue i think in sixes that is really important because sixes tend not to trust themselves that they are looking for a source that provides answers and then they can either you know they've had a really good a positive authority source that they just start trusting them blindly or they've had bad experiences or see the potential for bad experiences and just want to you know do away with it completely but in reality there's you know a balance very good what's your thought on conspiracy theories uh oh <laughs> um <laughs> i don't know i mean there's so many and I would have to, I don't know. <laughs> that would be hard, but yeah. All right. Well, you know, I realized we didn't do the breakout rooms with sixes, but oh, yeah, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. And um, we only have like 25 minutes. I just realized too. So I think we'll do a breakout rooms for sevens. Perfect. Um, and let me set that up for you guys. I'm going to stop sharing and go here. So again, um, talk about sevens. And let's see, page, page, page 205. You have a book, The Enthusiast, all of the, what it's like to be a seven. So talk about that and what surprised you about five. And I think, Josh, if you would like to get off the call, it's okay to, to do so. I know the level of energy is not there. A lot of energy. For more uh, of a group for tonight. 
All right, so let me put you in the groups. Some of the things that you talk about in your groups with um, type seven, and do we have any sevens actually in the group? I don't, I'm trying to look at your, I don't think. I, I don't think we do, Katya. Um, mm -hmm. I was commenting in my group that I saw several points of the seven that, that I was, and when I went back and looked at the one, which I'm sort of typing myself as, it did say that when I'm on the good side, I, I go towards a seven as far as character. So that sort of made sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so good. So you could relate to some of that. And then, you know, we'll, we'll get to like those positive characteristics. Maybe you can comment a little bit more how you experience that. Okay. Uh, what else you guys have talked about? Do, maybe do you, you, do you have a seven in your life? Um, or a friend? I say I, I know some sevens and uh, I definitely could see the whole um, like good um, ability to like just tell a story about anything that's happening and make it something that you like want to listen to. Um, so that ability to be able to kind of just like entertain people on a dime. Um, I've <laughs> seen in some of the sevens that I, at least I've decided they're sevens. I don't know if they actually are, but. Yeah. Brenda, so you have, you have a wing seven. Um, so how do you feel about that list? So, um, I mean, it's kind of encouraged because the six can be like, for me, the six, I'm always like doubting and skeptical and always doing the whole worst case scenario. But with the seven, I still have that like adventurous side and and the one thing I saw here almost everything could be more fun entertaining with a little effort so that's something like I've always lived by it's like if I just put a little effort if it, if it doesn't look like it's going to be good but I do a little more it's going to be good <laughs> so I like that positive side of it so I, I just want to go Aaron I you're a six are you a seven or a five wing I saw Aaron was a six Sorry, I'm really bad at muting and I'm muting my microphone. Um, I think I lean to more like towards a six wing seven. I've kind of been going back and forth, um, but I'm like the person that's like, if I can make something more fun, I'll pick the more fun option. Like kind of like just put sprinkles on it. Like why not? Like, yeah. like might as well have fun with it. So I feel like that should be like the motto for sevens. Like just put sprinkles on it. <laughs> like take it to that next level of fun. So um, I don't know a seven, but I know Annie Downs through her podcast. So I feel like I know a seven and she is, she shares a lot about her seven. So she's the one that's doing the Ennea Summer 2020 and also did the Ennea Summer 2018. And it's really helpful um, to listen to her podcast, but she talks even in her podcasts that aren't about Enneagrams, she almost always in all of her interviews brings up her seven-ness. Um, so she shared a lot with her audience about being a seven. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So I know a seven from podcasting and one time I went to his, uh, I guess, talk here in Columbus, Rob Bell, if some of you know Rob Bell. So he, uh, well, I actually, I, I don't remember what Enneagram podcast I listened. Maybe it was Andy. No, maybe it was Ian Crone. It uh, was. Yes, he was on uh, the typology. That's the Ian Crone's Enneagram podcast. And so he identified as a seven. And his storytelling abilities, I know if you've heard him speak, it's just amazing because um, he, you know, he is a former pastor and now is a speaker and a writer. Um, and sometimes he, it's just, a, you know, he kind of, kind of gives a sermon, right? But it's, it's a story after story after story after story. And you kind of, you are lost in this. And he also like so energetic. So I think I, I feel like, like you, Chris, I know, I know a seven that way. And so with that, honestly, so for me, it's really hard. I'm not sure like I have a seven in my personal life. 
and I also I, I feel like I'm so far away there's like I don't know a huge gap between nine and seven I feel like I don't know I'm like I can never be that oh my gosh these are like amazing people um so you know I'm it will not be that easy for me to speak about it because not not having so much of experience uh but i'll try and so i really love that quote uh richard Rohr's quote that says sevens try to imagine a life where there is no good friday and it's easter all the time so okay. and i think that explains a lot of how i understand that kind of um the motivation and the inner desire not to experience pain, uh, not to experience these negative emotions, you know, d disappointment, whatever, anxiety, um, sadness. This is just not about sevens. Um, and so that's the basic fear being trapped in pain and deprivation there. And so that's why they have uh, a million things to do, you know, adventure every time. And it's all positive and they can turn. So I guess this reframing thing, they can turn every negative thing. Um, so they're, you know, they're seven, right? I mean, they're thinkers, so they're in the head type. And so th that helps them to reframe a lot of things, uh, things that even worst case scenario, things are really happening badly into something positive, more optimistic there, you know, and even there will be a joke it, it, where we're supposed to be grieving or crying or something, there will be a joke or something, you know, fun, funny story that kind of might seem a little bit inappropriate, right, to the situation. Uh, they have monkey mind, so it's just like going, going, and kind of sort of jumping from one thing to another. Um, so they're deadly sin and passion gluttony in a way that I think they just love this, this joy of life. The, uh, it's just like, wow, let's experience that. And I don't know, again, Brenda and Erin, I don't know if you have that, like, wow, that's a new day. Let's do this. And I think I the, call that multitasking. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, let's do this and let's do that. And spontaneity, you know, spontaneity. Uh, and again, it's just all to bring that joy of life, not only to their um, kind of personal life, but to their environment. So it's like to bring that to into the world almost. Um, so the childhood message, it's not okay to depend on anyone or anything. And I don't know if any of you relate to that. Again, it's kind of, it's hard for me to think through that, but I wonder um, if it's again, um, de no, depending on yourself, I think it's almost like fives and sixes. Well, no, sixes are more dependable. But fives are, would be, you know, this is me, I'm gonna take care of myself. And in a way that again, I'm gonna create my own world that is full of joy and it's beautiful and right. exciting. Katya, I got to work with a seven at one point and I think it's kind of like what you just said, it's the, I'm gonna create my own entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, because no one else is gonna entertain me like I can. and. Uh, the, the one seven that I got to work with was an only child. And so, you know, a lot of that probably came from, you know, uh, with a bunch of adults and him. And so that became part of his persona. Right. Um, so again, it's in their heads. So yeah. they have to create that world of imagining, yep. you know, I don't know what they're doing, going on adventure. Yeah. Um, that just reminded me too, one thing they talked about the sevens, um, made me think of like Clark Griswold. They talked about how they plan and anticipate things so much, like that's part of it for them, that a lot of times like when they finally get to that event or whatever, it doesn't quite live up to what they had created or pictured in their head. Yeah. So I thought that was another interesting aspect too. And kind of there's one aspect that was particularly, you know, the book talked about is the addiction that there, the kind of that personality is more prone um, to, to kind of get attached to some of the addictive behaviors and, you know, drugs. And I think he describes maybe gambling um, in a way that, again, it creates excitement for you constantly and you don't feel pain. Um, so and the quarantine has been really hard on the sevens. I know in a lot of the Enneas circles, when this all started, they're like, if you have any sevens in your life, check on them because they're not doing okay. Um, 
they're used to constantly going on to the next event, the next adventure, the next play date, the next whatever, and to have to be forced to slow down, stop, and then possibly address some of their feelings towards what was going on is terribly, terribly uncomfortable for them. So I think the quarantine has probably been harder. Like as Josh said earlier, as a five, he's been, or a six, or a five, sorry, as a five, he's been planning for this his whole life. Like this is his moment. And for a seven, this is worst case scenario. Yes, it is. Yeah. So on the wing side, right, so type six and type eight, in stress they go type three. Um, is that correct? I don't think that's correct. Wait a minute. Yes. Wait. It does say, but usually the three, the three, six, and nine go together. Yes. No, that's not correct. So oh, yeah, I the three and nine is for three. the six. That's I, like if you're six, so you're stressed. Right. You go to one. And in um, security, you will go to five. Correct. So, so I apologize. I don't think I changed that slide. I'm sorry. Um, and so in stress and type one, you know how it's a very opposite of type seven in my head because it, ones, well, sevens are spontaneous. Let's just go and think. And one is very orderly. Let's um, kind of slow down. Um, and in security in type five, then I guess they will actually, they will stop consuming and start contributing. And I'm more comfortable with silence and solitude become more serious. Uh, and actually they can think, you know, I think some of the questions to kind of invite the spiritual growth for sevens were around, um, can you think about the meaning of your life, the purpose of your life, and kind of just a reflection on, you know, have you experienced sadness or what kind of events maybe in childhood that, you know, maybe you, what losses have you experienced that you haven't grieved? So things like that. Katya, this kind of goes with what Chris said, but I think, um, I think it, maybe this book or something else I had listened to, but it said that it, they think all types could benefit from doing therapy, but sevens by far the most could. And I think that has to do with them wanting to avoid any uncomfortable feelings, which a lot of times you have to craft like process in order for them to get to their best selves. Yeah. And you know what I also noticed again, like sp some specific things for se sevens. Um, yeah, uh, so reflect on the past and make a list of the people who you have hurt or whom you have hurt. No, who, no, you and whom you have hurt, then forgive them and, and make amends. And that's one of the 12 steps, actually. And, you know, in the programs for, you know, for any type of addiction or for dependent behavior or adult children of alcoholics. So it's very interesting that that's one of the things that is on the list for a seven, you know, as a gluttony, be, you know, being their sin is avoiding, avoiding, avoiding kind of drinking away or whatever, you, you know, doing the feeling and that you need to come back and face it. So um, on the wings side, uh, again, so we have a six, right? So with Mackenzie, a couple of others, um, Brenda and Gwen, no, is it Gwen? No. I can't see you. I'm sorry. Brenda? Yes, Brenda. And so for um, seven wing six, so they will get some of those uh, kind of more fearful, right? Um, they will be more fearful in their situation, more responsible. So the anxiety of six will be there. Um, they will be loyal and dutiful and entertaining. Um, and so I think, you know how they talked about the commitment issues with the seven, uh, not kind of the ability to commit to one relationship and stay there uh, through the bad and good of it. Um, and so I think the sixes will probably stay through that. I'm not sure about eight, but think sixes, I think because of their loyalty and that the, again, there is this in sixes, there's dependability on others wanting to be involved in people's, I think that will be there. Um, so 
seven wing eight, remember eights, they're gut types, very strong energy. And so can you imagine connecting the seven energy, which is pretty energetic, you know, if you enter into a room, you probably seven will be very much, not very noticeable because they're witty, they're very smart, and you know, amazing entertainment and just thinking on their feet very quickly. And so you get eight into that mix. So it's very com uh, passionate, competitive, bold, assertive, driven. So it's quite amazing mix there. All right, any other comments, um, I guess, on these, on the wings? Oh, you know what, I didn't finish the, my, I'm sorry guys, I'm so tired today. So <laughs> the best and at their uh, worst. The best are they're fun loving and spontaneous. Um, and so, you know, again, they're quick on their feet. They're very witty, they're really funny. And I think I probably imagine it's just so, so much fun to be around them. Um, oh, the, and the charming thing, it's, this is how they get out of the trouble actually using their charm. Um, and I think um, Ian described that one little story about his son in Whole Foods, right? How he just danced his way around his little trouble that he made with apples there, right? And at their worst, self-focused, impulsive, escapist, rebellious, distracted. And so I guess destruction comes from, again, not being able to focus to finish the task because they need the excitement and they just like, let's start a new thing. Let's start a new thing. And I guess even in a workplace, they suggest that you give them just, you give them freedom and you give them kind of the t to start task and ideas, but somebody else needs to finish the work, the actual work. Maybe the six will finish. <laughs> <laughs> um, I work with a seven and that happens all the time. We really? start it. He comes up with new projects, new ideas, and guess what? <laughs> I always finish them. <laughs> yeah, it was a good guess. Yeah. All right. So this is, this is it about seven. So those were dominant in type seven. So I think for next week, we have just one last chapter chapter 12 um and you know what i realized i think i was so focused on technology that everything works breakout rooms so that that i we didn't start with a prayer so i would like to finish with prayer okay <laughs> so um i guess do you have any other comments or questions for tonight and for the future session before we close with prayer no, you guys are really good. All right. So, Katya, did you say, so next week is the last week, and it's just chapter 12? Yeah, that's the last chapter. Okay. That's a smaller one. Yeah, it is. It's pretty small. I think we're going to talk about, um, like, next steps. What do you do with what you've learned or if you're still discerning some additional resources? Um, and how do you take this and move forward with um, the information that you have gained during this session? Okay. Okay. All right. So, no, any. No questions? Okay, let's pray. Holy God, we come to you giving you a thanks for this space um, to learn uh, about our friends, our spouses, um, and the tool that you have given us, the Enneagram tool, um, for the ability to uh, kind of dig deeper into ourselves and self-awareness and being more awake to who we are um, and the ability of your uh, Holy Spirit to transform us and change us. Um, and it, it, it does begin with that self-awareness. So we thank you for the space. Thank you for each and everyone here. Um, we pray that this discovery, self-discovery will continue with you um, through Christ Jesus and through the relationships that we have and the relationships that we have created here. So um, keep us safe for tonight. Bless those who are not able to be with us. Um, and we pray that all that we do um, truly to fulfill your will and fulfill your purpose of sharing your love in this world. 
And so, God, we pray all of this in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.